Happy and learning. Donald Hepp was a psychologist who thought about how psychological processes could be realized in the neural substrate of the brain. So one of his um, ideas was the following. When an axon of cell A is near enough to excite a cell B and repeatedly or persistently takes part in firing it, some growth process or metabolic change takes place in one or both cells such that A's efficiency as one of the cells firing B is increased. So this is known as a HEP postulate and is abbreviated as fire together, wire together. Consider a very simple neural model, namely a linear model. X1 to Xn are the inputs to the neurons. W1 to Wn are the weights for these inputs. And we have no non linearity so we simply sum linearly the inputs weighted by the weights to produce the output Y. And this is given here. So Y equals vector W times X, which I indicate here by W transpose X in matrix notation. Now, a very simple way of formalizing the Habian learning postulate is simply multiplying y and x, and that's shown here. So the weight wi is supposed to change according to the product between the output signal and the input signal. That means if y and x are large, then the weight will grow, and that's sort of according to the head postulate. If any of these is zero, then the weight will not change. What's sort of a generalization over the head postulate is that if you have negative responses, let's say y and x are both negative, then w would also increase, and if either an x or y is negative and the other one is positive, w would decrease. I mean, of course, in, for neurons it does not make sense to talk about negative firing rates, but in this linear model we also have negative activities possibly, and therefore this is sort of a generalization of the head postulate. These pointy brackets indicate an averaging over all the input patterns, mu. Here you see um, xi is sort of, you have different xi for different input patterns and also different outputs. So this is the average over all input patterns, which is abbreviated here with this um, pointy bracket notation. And eta is just a learning rate, a small constant typically. You can rewrite the whole thing in vector notation, so then we would make a statement how the whole vector changes over time, and uh, this term then translates to this term. And if we plug in y, as seen here above, you get this learning rate. So eta equals the average over all input patterns of w transpose x times x. Now in the following we will just assume that we will always average over all patterns, input patterns, and drop the index mu. What we already see from this equation is that the sign of the input patterns does not matter because we have x twice here, so if we change the sign of x, uh, the chi sign change enters this equation twice and it will have no effect on the change of the w. So you can have positive or negative X. Or you can flip, I mean, a one x vector, of course, can have positive as, value, as negative values, but if you flip the sign of that vector, that does not matter uh, for the development of the weights w. Now, here's an illustration of how this Habian learning works. So, here, this is just repeating the equation from the slide before. The change of the w equals some small learning rate times w transpose x times x. Now suppose we have just a two-dimensional input space, x1, x2. This is our w at time 1, indicated here with a superscript. And that separates the space into two halves. Any point here in this space will have a positive inner product with w. Any point here will, then, will have a negative inner product. And the farther away from the separation line, 
the greater the inner product. Now, that means since we use the inner product here and we take the average over the data points weighted by the inner product of the data points with the um, weight vector, that these two vectors here, this one and this one, so these two points, will be added to the weight vector positively, while this, which has a negative inner product, will be added negatively. So we could simply flip this point over on the other side, then it would be added positively, and then all of these three vectors pointing to the upper left would still be multiplied with a, with a sort of value of this inner product, which then would be positive. So you have to modify this W1 vector by three vectors, by the average over the three vectors that all point in this direction. And this is shown here. So you would add these three little vectors. Each of these green vectors is one of these W transpose x, x. Right? Well, this is a scalar, this is a vector, so this whole thing is a vector. And we have three of them because we have three data points. Okay, so in the next time step, we will then have this uh, weight vector. And again, we will modify this weight vector by a weighted average over these uh, three data points. Uh, again, this, will, w this one can be flipped over because it has a negative inner product with this vector. So again, we add three vectors, but now they are longer because the W is longer and it points more in the direction of the data points. Now, if you repeat this process, eventually, so this will be W3, but eventually you will have a weight vector that points in this direction and a result that we will find out sort of analytically uh, in the course of this lecture here is that it will point in the direction where the data points have the largest variance. Now a problem with the learning rule as we have it here is that it will grow indefinitely right? because each time you add these three vectors, this negatively, so we would flip this over, so you would add uh, an average over these three vectors weighted by this inner product. The inner product gets larger and larger, so you add more and more. So you would have an exponential increase of this weight vector. Of course, that is implausible, so we have to do something about it. There are different ways to do this. So one way is one could simply divide the weight vector after each iter learning iteration by its norm, so that it's by definition has length one. Here we want to consider a uh, slightly more sophisticated version, namely implicit normalization, as I call it. So here again we have the Harian learning rule, again now um, written again in the component-wise notation. And Archeoya has added this term to it. So, so this is the Oya le learning, root, le learning rule, um, which is pretty much the same as the Harian learning rule, but with this added term here. And now I would like to ask you to think for a moment, what happens if y is small? What does that mean for this equation and how would it behave? So please pause the video maybe and think a moment about what that would mean. Well, if y is small, then y squared is negligible compared to the y term. So we can drop this and we have approximately recovered the Habian learning rule again, uh, which does exactly what we had before. Second, I would like to ask you to think about what happens if y is large. Again, pause the video and think what the equation will be then and what that means for the dynamics. Well, if y is large, then y squared dominates the equation. We can neglect the y x term and the equation becomes this one pretty much. And this means, uh, so, so now the weight vector gets changed proportional to the weight vector itself because this is the only thing that... Um, depends on i, and that is exactly w. So you would simply my, uh, subtract uh, 
the weight vector multiplied with this constant here in front. And that simply performs a shortening of the vector. And what's important here is that this equation does not, or this part, so the contribution of the second term here above, does not change the direction of the vector. It only does performs a normalization. So the first term is the only one that actually changes the direction, and the second one only um, limits the growth of the vector. And since this, since this term is dominating for large y, it's quite obvious that the weight vector cannot grow infinitely. What we are now going to do is a so-called linear stability analysis. So um, we have our linear unit, and we have a dynamics, a weight dynamics, for this linear unit um, for a particular set of input vectors. So now linear stability analysis for a dynamics means one has to figure out what are the stationary points of the weight dynamics. Um, so that's given here. So as a first step, we will try to simplify this a little bit because it gets a little bit maybe unnecessarily complicated by having the y and the x here. So we would like to have a dynamic equation that only contains the w in some constants. Yeah? So this will be the first step. And then comes the actually the linear stability analysis. And the linear stability analysis, what you do is you figure out what are the stationary points of the dynamics. That means for which weights does the dynamics yield zero change? Right? So what are the weights for which the change of the weights is zero? And then the next step would be to ask for which weights um, is this dynamics stable? Right? So it might have a fixed point, but if you apply a small perturbation, the dynamics might actually run away from this fixed point, or it might go again towards the fixed point, and we are looking for these kinds of solutions because these are candidates for sort of the um, weight vectors to which the whole dynamics will converge. Okay, so what is the mean dynamics of the weight vector? So here we want to get rid of y and x. Okay, if we take eta on the other side, we have this equation, and now we just do a pretty standard um, manipulations here. So first we plug in uh, the expression for the linear unit here. So we replace y by w transpose x. That happens from here to here. Then we rearrange things a little bit. For example, we swap these two positions. Right? w transpose becomes x transpose w, which is possible because it's an inner product, and then we can simply swap the, in an inner product, we can swap the position of the two vectors. What we can also do is we can move this scalar behind the vector rather than in front. And again, here we have swapped the position. Then we change the way we, the order of calculation. So rather than first calculating x transpose w and then times x, we do it the other way around x, x transpose, and then times w. And we do this here as well as here. So we rearrange the parentheses, which is possible because uh, we have products here. And then what we do is we, I mean, we have this averaging here, pointy brackets. And with respect to this averaging, only the x varies, right? So we have to average over the x, but w is a constant with respect to the averaging process. So we can take all the w's out of the averaging process. And also, if we have a sum, or in this case, a difference of two quantities that we average, we can also take the difference between the averaged quantities. So we rearrange here the pointy brackets. We move them as far inside as possible so that they only contain the x and all the constants are out of the averaging process. Now, this is something that does not depend on w anymore. So with respect to our W dynamics, it's actually constant, and we can give it a name, C. It's called C here. It's actually a second moment matrix, x, x transpose. And please note, x is a vector. x, x transpose, think a moment. Is that a scalar, or is this a vector, or is this a matrix? Well, this is a matrix. 
So this is um, an n times 1 vector, and this is a 1 times n vector. If you multiply this, it becomes an n by n matrix. And this whole thing is called second moment matrix, as you might know from principal component analysis too much. Okay, so now if we define the C the way um, we do here, which by the way is a symmetric square matrix, then our dynamics in W converts to this equation. And this is now simpler than what we had before. We got rid of Y and X, and that's very nice. Okay, after having figured out what is the mean dynamics of the weight vectors, we now turn to the question, what are the stationary weight vectors? Here I just repeat the definition of C and our weight dynamics. Now for stationary weight vectors, we, have, um, we require that the change of the weights averaged over all data points is zero. And that means, if you look at this equation here, if the left side is zero, that means the right side is zero, and that means that CW equals this part here. And this is what I've written here. So CW equals W transpose CWW. Now please note that this is a scalar. It's a vector transpose times a matrix times a vector. So we can give it a name. We call it lambda here. And then this equation reduces to CW equals lambda W. Lambda still depends on W, but what's interesting is that if we write it like this, it becomes quite obvious that this is an eigenvalue equation. Yeah. Eigenvalue equation means matrix times vector equals scalar times vector. So an eigenvalue of matrix C is a vector. So an eigenvector of matrix C is a vector that gets only scaled if you multiply it with the matrix. Okay, so we found out that the stationary weight vectors under this dynamics are the eigenvectors of matrix C. Furthermore, if you look at lambda more closely and we already accept that Ws are the eigenvectors, then we see that, I mean, we know that lambda equals W transpose CW. Because W is an eigenvector, we can replace matrix C by lambda, according to this equation. Then we can take out the lambda, and we have this W transpose W here, which is the squared norm of W. And if you see that lambda equals lambda times the squared norm of W, it's quite obvious that the norm of W must be 1. Otherwise, this equation would not be true. So this tells us that the term that Oya has added to normalize the weight vector normalizes the weight vector actually to the value of 1, which is quite curious because it sort of, uh, I mean, doesn't have to be obvious that for any direction the weight vector would be normalized to 1. You could imagine maybe it's a bit longer in the direction where the sort of a heavy in terms of strong and maybe shorter in the other directions, but no, it's always normalized to 1. Okay, so with that we have solved number 2. So we know that the stationary weight vectors of the dynamics are the eigenvectors, which I call C alpha here, of uh, the second moment matrix C. By the way, Second moment matrix is also called covariance matrix or is identical to the covariance matrix if the data is mean free. So the term covariance matrix might be more familiar to you. But that's identity only holds for zero mean data. Okay, finally we want to, and that's actually the most difficult part, we want to figure out uh, which weight vectors are stable. So before we do that, a short reminder of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. I've used these terms already. So let's assume we have a symmetric matrix where the matrix is, uh, equals its transpose. And this means the symmetry. Then this is the eigenvector equation or eigenvalue equation. So matrix times eigenvector equals eigenvalue times eigenvector. And if the matrix is symmetric, uh, 
then you can choose the eigenvectors always such that they are orthogonal and normalize. That is the standard that one would do. So one would choose an uh, orthonormal set of eigenvectors. That is indicated here by the Kronecker symbol, Kronecker alpha beta, uh, which assumes the value 1 if alpha and beta are identical and assumes the value of 0 if they're different. Now, intuitively, you can imagine sort of in 2D, I would try to visualize this in 2D here. Imagine you have all the vectors with norm 1, which are the vectors on the blue circle, and I've drawn in four of these vectors. Now, if you apply matrix A, any matrix A, symmetric matrix A, to all of these vectors, you will, of course, change the set of points here and will be an ellipse, like the red one here. And usually, if you take an arbitrary blue vector here, uh, under the transformation of A, the direction as well as the length will change. So here, the direction has changed um, counterclockwise, and the length is a little, tiny little bit bit shorter, so it's not quite obvious that the length also change here, changes here. But here, if, if you take this vector, for instance, um, it becomes this vector, which is quite, uh, which is longer and also has a different direction. So in this case, there are only very few vectors that only change length but not direction. And this would be this vector here, which is along the uh, long principal axis of the ellipse, and this vector, which is along uh, the short principal axis of the ellipse. So these two vectors, and also their negative, would only change length but not direction. And that's sort of the key element of an eigenvector. And the eigenvalue tells us by how much the vector changes its length. So in this case, uh, lambda beta would be positive, something like, I don't know, 0.5 or so, and lambda alpha would be negative, uh, no, would also, sorry, um, would be Lambda beta would be greater than 1, 1.5 or so, and lambda alpha would be smaller than 1, let's say 1.8. You can, can also have negative eigenvalues. Um, so, and that would mean that the red vector then would be flipped, would, be, would point in the other direction, but that's not indicated here. And that is also not possible for second moment matrices. So second moment matrices have strictly um, non-negative eigenvalues. Now, I've already mentioned principal component analysis. Uh, that is a technique that allows, based on the second moment matrix, to figure out the directions of largest and smallest variants of a data distribution. So let's assume we have a two-dimensional space, we have a set of data points, and then principal component analysis would give us a vector that points in the direction of largest variance, which is the, this direction of largest where, where the data spreads the most. And this would be the, the vector of smallest variance. I mean, in two dimensions, you have just largest and smallest. Mm, if it would be higher dimensional, you would have sort of largest variance direction and then second largest under the constraint of being orthogonal to the first one, etc. So you would have a um, set of orthogonal directions with uh, sort of decreasing variance. And these principal components, as they are called, are the eigenvectors of the second moment matrix of this data distribution. So that's the relationship between principal component analysis and the eigenvectors and the second moment matrix. OK, now back to the question which weight vectors are stable. So we have this dynamics, and we already know that stationary points are the eigenvectors of matrix C. Since we want to analyze the stability of the stationary points, we can assume that our weight, weight vector is an eigenvector, C alpha, plus some small perturbation. So we consider our weight vector close to the eigenvectors. So this is shown here. Um, this is C alpha, C beta are the two eigenvectors or two eigenvectors of our second moment matrix. Uh, 
w is our weight vector, we assume that it is close to C alpha and it differs from C alpha by a small perturbation. And then we ask, how does the perturbation change? Does this perturbation lead away from the eigenvector or do, does it lead back to the eigenvector? In one case it would be unstable, in the other case it would be stable. So first we need to know, okay, how does, how does epsilon change under the dynamics? Well, we have the dynamics of W, and we have our definition of W as a combination of eigenvector and small perturbation. And with that, we can figure out uh, the change of epsilon in terms of epsilon. That's the key. So this is the change of epsilon. And the change of epsilon is exa exactly the same as the change of W, because C is constant. So then we can consider our normal dynamics. And now we don't want to express this in terms of w, but in terms of epsilon. So we have to plug in uh, our definition of w, which is c alpha plus epsilon. Right? So we replace each w here by c alpha plus epsilon, which then reads like this. Next thing we do is we simply multiply out all these terms. I mean, there are a lot of, lot of terms here. So if you multiply this out, this gives c times c alpha plus c times epsilon. These are these two terms. And here we have sort of uh, six possible terms. And um, the first term might be sort of c alpha transpose c, c alpha, c alpha. This is the term that doesn't contain um, epsilon not a single time. Then you can have look at the terms that contain epsilon once. And the first one would be epsilon transpose c, c alpha, c alpha. That is this one here. The next one would be C alpha transpose C epsilon C alpha. That is this one here. And then you have C alpha transpose C C alpha epsilon. So that would, would be this one. So these three terms all contain the epsilon just once. There are more terms, but the other terms contain epsilon at least twice. And there's even one term that contains epsilon twice. And for small epsilon here, we say use a small epsilon. These terms are negligible, so we just ignore them and we live here with a, with a approximation. Okay, next thing we do is just reordering the terms. So, and using the uh, property, no, actually we are using the property that C alpha is an eigenvector of C, so we replace C by lambda C. Lambda, uh, we replace C by lambda alpha here. here. We can't do this here, but we can do it here, for instance. Interestingly, we can also do it, um, no, here it's clear, here it's clear, somewhat surprising maybe here, um, that C alpha transpose C is also, uh, I mean, that in this context, we can also um, replace uh, C by lambda alpha. We had the equation C, C alpha equals lambda alpha C alpha. Now if we take the transpose on both sides, that would be C alpha transpose C transpose equals, well, transpose of lambda doesn't make any difference, right? C alpha transpose. And now the important thing is that um, C is a, is a symmetric matrix, so we can drop this, the transpose, and we see that this then becomes C alpha transpose C equals lambda C alpha transpose. Okay, so this is the reason why we can actually, um, where are we? Yes. Replace C here as well by lambda alpha. Okay, so we could almost rid of, of C altogether. There's only C left here. And now we can group the terms. So we have our lambda alpha, C alpha, C epsilon, um, 
we can if we take the alpha out here we get c alpha transpose c and that is because of the normalization is one so we can drop c alpha transpose c here that gives us this term we can take the lambda alpha out here which is so that this becomes this term this here becomes this term and here again we have our c alpha transpose c alpha which is normalized to one so we have lambda epsilon lambda alpha epsilon this cancels with this one here we can swap these two because it's an inner product so then we have c alpha transpose epsilon c alpha then these two become identical so we have minus two lambda alpha c alpha transpose epsilon c alpha and this is this term right okay so now we have a compact way of writing what happens with epsilon that does not depend on alpha but on uh, on w but on epsilon n we still have c alpha there Okay, so this is our W, and we are, but we are mainly interested in what happens with the perturbation, so this would be this equation. Now to make it even simpler, we don't consider the vector epsilon, but we will consider the projection of the vector epsilon onto one of the eigenvectors, C beta. So here's our C alpha. This is our weight vector. This is a perturbation. This is a... Uh, this is sort of the, yeah, the perturbation that gives us a W from an eigenvector. And um, now we project the perturbation and also the change of the perturbation onto another eigenvector. Beta could be equal to alpha, then it would be projected onto alpha, but can also be projected to some other eigenvector. So we consider C beta transpose epsilon and C beta transpose delta epsilon. Right? So this is what we know, and this is what we wonder what that might be. Okay, so what happens with this C with this projected part of epsilon? So we have this equation up here and we just multiply both sides with C beta transpose. So then we on the left side we get this one, on the right side we get this one here. So what happens here? Here again, we can use the fact that C beta is an eigenvector, so we can replace C by lambda b, lambda beta. Here, nothing changes. Okay, this also doesn't change. Next, we see we have um, we have the C beta C alpha here. We know that the eigenvectors are orthonormal, which means that this one here is chronica beta alpha. So if beta and alpha are identical, then it would be one because the eigenvectors are normalized. If they are different, then it is zero because different eigenvectors are orthogonal to each other. So we can replace this inner product between the two eigenvectors by chronica beta alpha. So the next thing we do is we replace this alpha by beta which we can do because this whole term only exists if beta and alpha are the same. Right? If, so if alpha would not be equal to uh, beta, beta, this would be zero, and then we would drop the whole term in general. And this has the advantage that now we have in all three terms, we have C beta transpose epsilon. Right? So we can take this out, which gives us this thing. And now we can distinguish two different cases, namely beta equals alpha. In that case we get this one here um, because we have lambda beta minus lambda beta because beta equals alpha. Uh, so that would uh, cancel, these two terms would cancel out each other so we are only left with this part minus 2 lambda beta and then times C beta transpose epsilon. So this is the first case. The other case is beta is not equal to alpha, then we know this one here is discarded. And these two are different, so we need to maintain here. We 
need to consider the difference between two, these two eigenvalues. Okay, so we have our W here, and now here we see we have figured out how the projection of this perturbation onto any of the eigenvectors changes over time. So what, what is that dynamics? And if we now consider sort of this, that the C beta transpose delta epsilon, which is, I mean, delta epsilon is the difference between the epsilons in two successive iterations of um, our algorithm, our dynamics, um, which equals this one here. And then we see that uh, C beta transpose delta epsilon is the same as delta C beta transpose epsilon. And that allows us to replace C beta transpose epsilon by just an S beta, which is the projected part of epsilon on C beta. And um, if we also define kappa alpha beta to be this part here on the, on the right side, actually this part here without the C beta transpose, right? It's given here. Then we can rewrite our dynamics as delta S beta, which is this part, equals kappa alpha beta S beta. S beta is this part, and this part here is our kappa alpha beta. So this is a very simple, very compact form uh, um, of writing the dynamics of the perturbation projected on any of the eigenvectors. Okay, so now we can consider different cases depending on whether beta equals alpha or not and depending on the relationship between lambda beta and lambda alpha. So here again, summarize our weight vector, then the definition of the projection of the perturbation onto any of the eigenvectors, and we have the dynamics of, the, of this projected perturbation and with a factor here, kappa. Now, if you look at this equation, uh, you can also think of a differential equation, S dot equals kappa times S or so. Um, so that, I guess, should ring a bell if you know something about uh, differential equations because it's one of the simplest differential equations. And we know that this uh, is a dynamics with an exponential decay. Okay, if for simplicity we consider now S dot equals kappa s as a differential equation without the indices down here, right? So then if we start with some value s, now depending on the value of kappa, uh, s will behave in different ways. Um, so for instance, if kappa is zero, then obviously s dot is zero and we will have a constant response, right? So this is time. And this is s. Um, if kappa is positive, then s will grow and it will actually grow exponentially. And if kappa is negative, then it will go down to zero, it will be exponential decay to it. Yeah. So S develops with this equation, S either stays where it is, or it will exponentially grow, or it will exponentially decay. Yeah. So this is for kappa uh, greater zero. equals zero and kappa Okay, so now let's co first consider the case where beta is not equal alpha. 
and lambda beta is less than lambda alpha. I've drawn this here, so we have C alpha here, we have C beta here, uh, we have our perturbation epsilon in this direction, this is our S beta, um, and this is the C beta direction, and now what happens if um, lambda beta is smaller than lambda alpha? Okay, so we have to go up here, we see beta is not equal alpha, so this equation, this term here applies. C beta is smaller than lambda alpha. That means this thing here is negative. So we have to look here. Kappa is less than zero. It would decay, right? So kappa alpha is less than zero, and it would decay. So delta S beta would be negative. It would go back towards C alpha in this direction. Next case is beta is not equal alpha and lambda beta equals lambda alpha. We have seen that this means that the perturbation just stays where it is. And then case three would be uh, lambda beta is greater than lambda alpha, so this would be positive, the perturbation would increase. Case 4 now is we project the perturbation onto the eigenvector that we have used as a weight vector, the basis for the perturbed weight vector, so we have this, uh, this part here. This means we need to use the first equation here, the first term. Now, all the eigenvectors of a second moment matrix are positive, so this term is negative and there's no other way, so this perturbation will decay. And now we can go and we can combine different cases. For instance, we can combine case 3 and 4, uh, and then we see that the perturbation projected onto the C beta direction that increases because of the positive eigenvalue, and the perturbation in the projected onto the C alpha direction that decreases, so the vector will sort of be normalized, but it will turn away from C alpha, in this case towards C beta. Sorry for the German word here, Richtung means direction. Okay, so to summarize, we have uh, considered four different cases. Uh, we have seen that depending on whether beta equals alpha or not, and the relation between lambda beta and lambda alpha, the perturbation along C beta decays, persists or grows, and the perturbation along C alpha, um, that we know that always decays. Yeah. And now the question is, okay, what are the conditions under which... Uh, weight vector is stable, and it's only stable if all directions decay, otherwise it would sort of turn away, the perturbation would increase, and, uh, uh, if, and that means, so, I mean, C alpha always decays in any case, but for these cases, so when for the eigenvectors that are different from the eigenvector that, that belongs to the sort of, which forms the base of the weight vector, um, so these, the eigenvector, eigenvalues of the other eigenvectors should all be smaller than the eigenvalue of the eigenvector, um, of the weight vector, right? Um, and that means that there's only one eigenvector that is stable, namely the eigenvector with the largest eigenvalue, so that all other eigenvectors have a smaller eigenvalue. That's the only stable one. Okay, an obvious question here is now uh, what happens if two, if there are two largest eigenvalues, so if the two eigenvectors with the largest eigenvalues both have the same eigenvalue, well then it's actually undefined, I mean it's, uh, it's um, then any eigenvector, maybe I can draw this, 
So let's assume we have one eigenvector here and one eigenvector here. And these are the two eigenvectors that have the largest eigenvalues and the eigenvalues are identical. I mean, then we know from, yeah, from linear algebra, principal component analysis theory or so, that any other, eigen, other vector that we would draw in this plane, like this one, also has the same eigenvalue. So any vector that is within this plane um, has the same eigenvalue. So every vector is as good as any other vector. So the vector would simply be in that plane and maybe drift a little bit or something, but there would be no systematic movement. But it would, if you have two dimensions with a large eigenvalue, an identical eigenvalue, and then a number of other dimensions with smaller eigenvalues, the weight vector would definitely move away from the other dimensions into this two-dimensional subspace. Okay. So we see here now what uh, Hebb's rule does. Uh, it picks out the eigenvector with the largest eigenvalue, which is pretty much figuring out, or calculating, or learning the first principal component, so the direction in which the data varies the most. Okay, to summarize. We started with the linear unit with Oya's rule. We have figured out the average weight dynamics with the second moment, mat moment matrix C. Then we have seen that the stationary points under this dynamics are the eigenvectors of matrix C, normalized to length 1. This normalization is what this extra term does. And then we have seen that the only stable weight vector is the eigenvector with the largest eigenvalue. And if there are several eigenvectors with largest eigenvalue, then any linear combination of these eigenvectors would be a uh, stationary point. Well, it's not really stable in the sense that it will always converge to that, but then you would have sort of a stable subspace to which the weight, weight vector would converge. Right? So you could not really say it's a stable point because a stable point means it always converges back to this point. But if you have two eigenvectors with the same eigenvalue, then any vector... Uh, within that two-dimensional space would be equally good, and then there's no convergence to one point. But it will, but the weight vector will converge into this two-dimensional subspace. Okay, so far we have looked at just a single unit, and we have learned that a single unit produces an output and uh, a weight vector that points in the direction of largest variance of the input signals. Now, how can one generalize this? How one can sort of calculate or learn uh, further eigenvectors? This would just learn the first eigenvector. So here's an architecture that could learn more eigenvectors. And the idea is you have one unit that learns the first eigenvector. Right? The eigenvector is the set of weights here. And then this would be y1 would be the projection of our data onto this first eigenvector, namely the inner product between the input signals and the weight vectors. And now if you if you complement the dynamics of the single units um, by an inhibitory term. So this is so the VIs, VJKs are all inhibitory, so blue means inhibitory synapse. Um, So this is the input, the normal input, and this is the input from the other units. And in, in this case, it's asymmetric. So this unit receives sort of an inhibitory input from the other, uh, from from the first cell, and the strength of the synapse is governed by this equation. So if y j and y k are correlated, or in this case, if we consider these two, if y one is correlated with y two. Because of this negative sign here, this epsilon, by the way, is not the perturbation that we had earlier. It's a small learning rate, right? The epsilon here is similar, similar to eta. Um, because of this minus sign, if these two units are correlated, this synapse will be more and more negative. And this means that this negative input will decorrelate these two cells. 
and the synapse here will become more and more negative until these two units are strictly decorrelated. So only if these two, uh, if this average over all data points is zero, then the synapse will stop to, to decrease. If the two units would be anti-correlated, then this would be positive because it, this would be negative times the negative sign would be positive. The synaptic weight would increase. So the weight of this synapse here by this learning rule here is converges to a value where these two units are uncorrelated. And that in turn means that the weight vectors here must be orthogonal to this one. And that falls out of the uh, theory of principal component analysis. Otherwise, I mean, apart from being uncorrelated to this one, this unit will still try to move its weight vector into a direction of largest variance. But the direction of really first largest variance is already taken by this unit. And because of this decorrelation, this unit cannot do the same again. So it will find the second direction or the direction of second largest variance orthogonal to the first direction. Yeah. Because the, these weight vectors follow exactly the same dynamics as before. And yeah, and this goes on, right? So we have a third unit, which by these two synapses is forced to be uncorrelated to the first two, but otherwise tries to find a direction uh, which has large variance. So this will then converge to a third eigenvector of the second moment matrix, with the, which is the third direction uh, of largest variance, or the direction of third largest variance. Now this network here is now able to extract not just one principal component, but several, and they are ordered. First principal component, second principal component, third principal component. Now there's a variant to that that is symmetric, and if, you, if I flip back and forth here, uh, between the two slides, you see that uh, the architecture um, only differs by these back projections. So in this case, the units all try to decorrelate each other, which means now this unit does not have priority anymore over the other ones. And they're all struggling for the, for the uh, largest variance directions. Of course, they must be uncorrelated. That's what this thing here guarantees. Mm. So what they do is they overall converge to the subspace of largest variance, but they don't form a strict hierarchy in saying, well, the first unit gets the largest variance, the second unit gets the second largest variance, but they somehow sort of compete for the space, but, they, but since it's completely even, they just settle for this space, but within that space of the, in this case, three largest eigenvalues or the three principal components, within that space, the rotation is completely arbitrary. Right? So the, this network will converge to a result where the three units span the space of the three first eigenvectors, but within that space, there can be a random rotation. Now, um, so what, what is the difference between these? What are the advantages and disadvantages of these two methods? Well, this one, the first one, with asymmetric connections has, in some sense, the advantage that you have a clear order. So you have the first principal component, uh, the second principal component, and the third principal component. So if you want that, then you need this architecture. If you don't need that because you're just interested in the subspace, then this method might be uh, advantageous where you learn a principal subspace rather than really the individual uh, components because this converges faster, right? You can imagine that in this case, these two units can really learn, I mean, they're sort of, um, they can only learn really once this has converged, right? Otherwise, they have, they have a moving target. While here, all three sort of converge simultaneously uh, onto the sort of nearest sensible configuration. So this would uh, converge faster, but doesn't have a clear order of principal components. So to summarize, we see that Habian learning allows um, a neuron 
to uh, develop a weight vector that converges to the direction of largest variance in the data. And this is maybe a sensible thing because it captures, uh, in some sense, the most prominent variation in the input and represents that. And this is a very systematic, very principled way of reducing dimensionality from high dimensions to lower dimensions, but uh, still maintaining as much variance, strictly speaking, which is often equated with as much information as possible, which is not necessarily the case. So it might also be that small variance directions carry the relevant information, but it's definitely a good heuristics to assume that large variance directions uh, contain more relevant information than small variance directions.